And good evening, everybody. My name is Al Rochelle, and thank you so much for joining us for our second in a series of debates for Clearwater City Council <laughs> coming up on March the 17th. Now, tonight's debate includes candidates for council seat number two. There are five candidates, as you can see right here. We'll take a short break and then bring in the candidates for seat number three that has four candidates. And remember, you can vote on all of these candidates. It's an at-large uh, type of a delegation for the city council. The rules for the debate are the same as we had last night. We'll begin with each of the candidates explaining why they're running for their respective offices. That will be in alphabetical order, which is the way you're seated right now. And then at the end of the questioning, each candidate will deliver a closing statement in reverse order from the opening. The order candidates will be answering each question will also be rotated, so each candidate will have a chance to answer several questions first. And I'll make it very clear which candidate is supposed to answer the questions. Now we're going to stick to a one-minute time limit on all the answers unless I tell the candidates otherwise. We have timing lights here on the podium. As I told you, yellow means you have 15 seconds. A red flashing light means that your time up and you need to feed more money to the parking meter. <laughs> when time is up, please wrap up your answer as quickly as possible. If not, I'll politely cut you off and we'll go on to our next questioner. An audience, just like last night, you're going to be quiet observers. There's going to be no clapping, no booing, shrugging of the shoulders, no response period, no, oh my goodness, none of that. We have people here that will help me escort you out of the room, and you do not want me to embarrass you if you're out of line. So do you understand that, audience? Yes. All right, so let's get going this evening. We'll start out with our opening statements in alphabetical order. We'll start out with Mark Bunker. Mark? Yes. I'm not your typical candidate. I've spent most of my life in the media, including 10 years in TV news in San Diego. I moved here in, uh, to Clearwater because I cared about this city long before I got here in 2000. I've been working for over 20 years helping people uh, abused or defrauded by Scientology. And when I got here, I found out that the city wanted nothing more than to keep Scientology off the front page of the paper, and politicians viewed it as the kiss of death to take them on. Well, not me. I'm not going to be silenced. I'm running to make a difference, not just on Scientology, but to give voice to those who feel no one's listening and no one cares. For those who, uh, who, who feel that the good old boys network here is favoring developers over people. I want to put people over power and cut bullies like Scientology down to size. All right, thank you, Mr. Bunker. Our next candidate, Mike Menino. Mike, you have a minute. Perfect. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you, staff. Thank you, Al, for putting this on. March 17th is the start of a very pivotal period in our city. It's an opportunity uh, for us as citizens to kind of reclaim our city and redefine it as one of the best cities in the state of Florida. To be a successful candidate as an elected official takes three key ingredients. Number one is passion to serve. Number two is knowledge of our city and local governance. And number three, certainly not the least, is leadership experience. I hope by the end of this sixth and final forum that we've been through that you will find that Michael Menino checks all those boxes of substance I vow to fortify the trust in City Hall. I promise to work as hard as I can to earn everybody's vote, and I will work it tirelessly to protect, promote all of Clearwater now and for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Menino. Mr. Rector, your turn. I'm Bruce Rector, and I have been richly blessed in my life with many different experiences. I've had a chance to lead an international organization and travel the world and work with thousands of leaders and communities all over the world to solve problems. My current work, uh, we do sports facilities for cities all across the United States. I've helped communities all over the United States solve their problems. I've uh, been an athletic coach for all of my son's sports teams. I've been a marathoner. I've run, uh, I've authored a book. I've, uh, I've done many different things, volunteered for many organizations. I'm a member of Calvary Church and I volunteer my time. I have a servant's heart, which my parents taught me. Through all that I've learned that communities can be successful if they do two things. If they care, carefully listen to their citizens, they build consensus, and they learn to collaborate for the good of the entire city. That's the kind of leadership and experience I hope to bring to the city of Clearwater City Council. Mr. Director, thank you so much. Eliseo Santana. Yes, uh, my name is definitely Eliseo Santana, and I want to say that 
I had a prepared speech, and I, I have to address something that, uh, you know, it is so important for our city to be a welcoming place, to be able to act out of love and to be of service. I, as your public servant, want to represent your interest, and I want to use the tools that we have available, not out of hate, but out of being able to produce something and that we can make this city the best that it can be. I support the city manager's effort and the other people in the city council that have approached opening up the dialogue, that open up the tables to be able to make sure that we have people at the table and we have a dialogue. We need to have conversation in order to grow to be the city that we're supposed to be, the city that we have the potential to be. I want to be your servant. I am here to represent you. Mr. Santana, thank you so much for that. Lynn Teixeira, Lena. Hi, um, thank you all for being here. I am here because I truly feel that I have a lot to offer this city. The most obvious, of course, is the much needed diversity to the existing council. But I want you to look beyond what you see, what I am. So look beyond the fact that I'm a woman, my age, or my ethnicity, because what I'm offering is my track record. I have led several boards where I represented merchants and residents and stakeholders and I've done so passionately and I've rolled up my sleeves and I've worked hard for years. And I have accomplished a lot. I have joined forces with other people who love Clearwater just as much as I do and together we brought over 90 businesses to Clearwater this year alone. Art institutions, seminars, so imagine what I've accomplished as a private citizen. Imagine what I can accomplish as your next city councilwoman. Better yet, find out. All right, thank you very much. All right, let's get right to the questions. And some of these the topics were brought up in our debate last night and the other six that you had. That's a lot of, a lot of debating. Uh, here's the question. Some council candidates have gone on record opposing the city's $64 million Imagine Clearwater project. Is the project right on target, or are there things in the plan you would like to see change? Mr. Rector, you go first. As I said, I work for a company that does youth and amateur sports complexes around the United States, projects similar in size to what we're proposing for uh, Coachman Park. Uh, these cities, uh, these complexes and, and the improvements we're making to the park are only valuable to the community if they have a proper balance between tourism, economic development, ep economic impact, and community use. So far, I've only seen economic impact. I've not seen a broad community use component proposed for the facility. So I would, pr I would support right-sizing the facility and more broadly programming the uses. Our community wants to know how they would use the park if it were improved for particularly for that amount of money and they want to see would there be high school graduations there, running festivals like we currently have, uh, yoga classes, all kinds of activities not only music. So right. I would like to see a more broadly focused program and the, and the project right sized. All right, uh, Mr. Santana, your turn to answer that question. Does anybody here have $64 million that they're gonna, they want to invest? <laughs> I don't think I have any here. But let me tell you, it is important to make sure that we enter into something that is going to make our city viable and vibrant, and we need to make sure that the money is spent correctly. We need to invest that money. Look, if we're going to be spending $64 million and still incur a debt, an operating expense of millions a year. There's something wrong with that equation. I am going to use my experience with my 30 years with the sheriff department as an administrator doing budgeting to make sure that our pennies, every single penny that comes in is used wisely and is used to get the intended purpose that we have. I am not convinced the way it's set up here is not happening. It's going to cost us significant amount of losses after we spend the $64 million. Let's look at that. I am going to look at that and make sure that our money is spent wisely. Mr. Sherry, same question. I have been blessed to be well-traveled, and I've visited 
beautiful little scenic valley, villages, coastal towns, and robust metropolitan cities. They all have one thing in common, and that is there is a point of congregation, identity, that unites the city, where not only the coffers are filled, but memories are created. We, Clearwater, do not. A mall is not a destination that can identify us. Having said that, I am not completely happy with the plan. The data that's coming out, in my opinion, I have not completely read it, but the study does have some information and data that I question, the seating, and the full-time positions, just to name a few. I do feel a little bit concerned that I don't see any concrete ways to ensure that it's going to be fiscally responsible. Um, so I definitely want to stop the library in its tracks. That's the horse before the, the, the you know, it's, it's in the wrong sequence. So we need to tweak it. But I do want it. We deserve it. All right, thank you. Mr. Bunker, same question. Yes, well, I love the plans for the park. They look beautiful. But... I don't see anything in the plans that addresses the reasons we need them. We're hoping to bring people downtown, but person after person I talk to says they don't want to come downtown because of the presence of Scientology. So we've got to deal with that. They say they find the downtown creepy or intimidating, or they just don't want money going into uh, Scientology's pockets. So I think we as a council and the mayor need to grow a spine and be uh, unafraid to say the word Scientology and take them on. Work with the federal government to explain why they don't deserve their tax-exempt status. Remove that, which they didn't have until 1993, and that will put an estimated $17 million back into the city coffers every year, according to Scientology's own uh, uh, numbers from their Freedom magazine. You want to pay for a 4,000-seat covered amphitheater? Boom. Done. And uh, short of that, we need to scale back uh, the plans. You, Mr. For... Mr. Menino, same question. Yeah, thank you, Al. Uh, $64 million Imagine Clearwater plan, I do not support it as you're seeing it now. I have a problem with the originality of the concept, which originated from you, the citizens, passing a referendum in 2017 that stated you wanted to renovate that park. But what you didn't know was that your park in green space and water area was going to turn into a monstrosity of an entertainment venue that you did not want. I'm not telling you my opinion, I'm telling you what knocking on thousands of citizens' doors throughout your community are telling me. They have problems with spending $15 million on renovating libraries and putting rooftops. They have problems on the orientation of your band shell. They have problems on Baywalk being so close to water's edge invading privacy and safety. They have problems on losing parking where there's already parking shortages, and they have problems on mortgaging your children's future on a project that is too big for downtown. All right. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll move on to the next question. We know that a development is a big deal in the city of Clearwater. The cities of Dunedin, Safety Harbor, even St. Petersburg have developed their own unique way of creating a solid walking experience. Is that what you're hoping for in Clearwater? And is there any guarantee that kind of approach would work here, given many would just prefer to walk the beaches or head to the small towns to the north? We'll start out with Mr. Manino. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Al. Uh, a great question. I do not think um, that you can use cities like Safety Harbor uh, in Dunedin and compare them to Clearwater. I don't think that's fair to do to your city of Clearwater or to those cities of Dunedin or Safety Harbor. I do, however, think that to have a vision of walkable streets and a walkable downtown waterfront that's <laughs> ignited uh, is a reasonable vision. I think that vision has to start with changing some of your building and development codes that you have downtown, which will enable investors to want to come spend money and develop your downtown. It'll stop some of the red tape and hang-ups that they have to go through now because if you're wasting investors' time, you're wasting their money. They're not going to invest in your city like we're wanting them to. I think there is a lot that we can do to, do, uh, to, to better downtown and to bring attention in businesses. Uh, and I think it starts with uh, redevelopment codes and taking care of some of the zoning that's down there currently. Mr. Rector, same question for you. Yes, uh, success, successful communities and the projects that we do, similar to this, they, they do what makes sense for them, not what looks nice or what works in another community. And that's the feedback I've also had from many of our our folks in our neighborhoods that they don't see how the proposed project as per currently is makes sense for Clearwater. We have to take advantage of our unique waterfront which they don't have in these smaller communities. We have a larger community. We have institutional presence, Scientology here that they don't have in those smaller communities. 
uh, but we need to make what may, we need to do what makes sense for Clearwater. And that best idea may not come from a, a, a city in Pinellas County or even Tampa Bay. Uh, uh, our Sugar Sand Festival, which has been wildly successful, <clears throat> came from an idea from South Africa. <laughs> and that is where Clearwater needs to start looking for ideas. We need to quit letting people tell us what we are, what we can and can't do. We need to think big, and we need to look for the best ideas to be competitive with cities like us all around the world. Right. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Mr. Santana, same question. All the cities that you mentioned, all the towns, they don't have something that we have in Clearwater. We have Clearwater Beach, which by its nature is attracting hundreds of thousands of visitors from across, not just locally, but across the United States and internationally. We need to be able to bring these, these visitors, these tourists that are coming to our city in Clearwater Beach and bring them into the downtown area. We need to start revitalizing that area in a way that will attract them. We need to be able to move them from the beach over to the mainland. That is the key to our viability. That is where we're going to see the spark happening. There are many tools, there are plans, there are valuable to make that spark happen. And right now I'm out of, almost out of time, so I'll Stay tuned. You'll get a message. Remember, Santana. Okay. Right. Are you sure you're not into marketing or something like this? Okay. Uh, Ms. Teixeira. I am the only person here who opened up a business just to help revitalize downtown Clearwater. I live it every day. It's a struggle. I have to program, program my wine bar because the traffic is not there. So you can make it as walkable as you want, but if we don't make it easy, if we don't encourage or de economic development and businesses, then it's not gonna happen. We have a perception problem. The city is perceived as a city of no. Small businesses do not feel that we are welcome. The processes are broken. They're archaic and not user friendly. So we can have a beautiful walkable downtown but if we can't stay alive, there's no one that's going to come there again. And it's going to be this revolving door of nothingness. So we have to facilitate and welcome these small business owners and residents to facilitate this process. We can't just expect people to walk there with nothing there. All right, thank you. And Mr. Bunker. Yes, Lena makes some really good points. We do need to make it easier for people to have a business downtown, cut the red tape, and... Uh, Tell people why they should come downtown. Again, I love the park. I'd like to be a success. But the people of Clearwater did not vote for a 4,000-seat amphitheater. We need to scale it back, look at um, what the people in the city asked for, and try to deliver that. And frankly, I I've been coming downtown for months and months and months, shooting videos at places like Lena's Poor Yours to showcase the businesses downtown and to show you the amazing meals that you can get downtown. Uh, I do that with my friend Aaron Smith-Levin. Um, so if it's safe for me to come downtown, it's safe for everyone. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but we'll find out, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, here's another question for you. A city commission study of the downtown area concluded one of the biggest obstacles to Clearwater redevelopment is housing there aren't enough affordable downtown units or affordable housing for the working class. What's your solution? Mr. Santana, go first. Opportunity zones. This is a new tax that has just recently came into being. It's a new program that allows individuals that have made a huge amount of money to be able to, instead of paying that money in taxes, to be able to funnel it into opportunity zones. And these are things that we're going to be able to use that resources, that money, to be able to first identify which properties are there. If you're a realtor, we're going to be looking for you because we're going to be looking at the properties get, that could be developed. And we're going to be looking at the, then we're going to look at the investment brokers, so like, like Raymond <laughs> James, where they have that funnel of money coming in from these individuals that, have, that need to put the money somewhere, and we want them to be able to be attracted, to be able to come into our city and invest that money. We have to have, we can do it if it's properly done. Opportunity zones. 
Mr. Shera. Um, I'll pick up where he left off. I have, along with some very talented people, have already had three seminars where we invited local investors to be educated on these opportunity zones. This is a great opportunity. It's not actually taxes. It's a tax-exempt program. Uh, the good thing about it is that it asks the investors to stay in the location for 10 years so they don't just flip. The great thing about this is we can use this for work force housing for the teachers and the new police officers and the service industry. Um, and so I've already begun the process of educating these investors and having uh, conferences and, and promoting that idea. And I, I'm looking forward to actually identify certain sites for that. All right. Mr. Bunker. Could you repeat the question, please? City Commission study the downtown area concluded one of the biggest obstacles to Clearwater redevelopment is housing not enough affordable housing units or affordable housing for the working class. What's your solution? Yes, well, we have to require that uh, new developments uh, are mixed income so that uh, there are always some places available for the workforce. Um, and, and, and I'm shocked that uh, our police officers and our firefighters, many, many of them commute into the city because it's so expensive here. That shouldn't be the case. Our emergency personnel should be living in our communities. So we need to find a way to help them as well. Uh, we need to change the zoning laws to allow a, a, a smaller a, a granny flats or an apartment over a garage or tiny homes to fit I I into the neighborhood. We also might want to consider smaller plots for a, a tiny home community. There's a great plan in, in uh, Detroit that I love, and we need to continue working with great groups like uh, Habitat for Humanity. Mr. M uh, Menino. Thank you. Uh, as an elected council member, I will work hard uh, and push council uh, into directions and policies to create affordable and workforce housing. This isn't just an issue that Clearwater residents and workers face. It's an issue that our entire region faces. There are challenges to building affordable housing. Number one is... Where are you going to build them, right? There's not much property and land in this downtown area. The last meeting I was at, I was told there's only 14 properties left that aren't owned by the Church of Scientology. They're owned by our city, the county, and private investors. It, some issues with attracting buyers into those is the layered financing that it takes to build these projects. You have to educate investors on those layered financing. Builders always want to build bigger, better, and make more money. So you have to have initiatives. You have to create initiatives to make them want to, to attract them into those areas to buy. Equal opportunity areas are great. They are challenges as well because they are a double down. If you purchase something for a million dollars, you have to guarantee yourself to put a million dollars back into it. That's not attractive for some investors, so there are challenges to that. All right. And Mr. Rector. It's a very important issue, uh, as one of the other candidates just said. It uh, affects our public safety and the cost to, uh, to recruit uh, good police officers and firefighters. Uh, many of them are, cannot afford to live in Clearwater. That goes for a lot of younger workers with families that uh, work in Clearwater, but many can't afford to live in Clearwater. So I have been visiting a lot of homes and neighborhoods. I've seen some fantastic things that folks have done by revitalizing their home, re remodeling their home. Uh, but I've also seen many elderly folks in our community who can't afford to do that. So some type of programs or test pilot programs around the country where we can, we can help the elderly uh, protect themselves, but also revitalize those neighborhoods are important. Last night at the mayor's forum, there was ideas on certain sites here in the community that can be repurposed for affordable housing. All right, thank you. Now, I'm going to state this uh, once and only once. We are not here to argue the benefits or the non-benefits of the Church of Scientology, but we are here to talk about city policy and how it might relate to the church. Mm -hmm. Another obstacle cited in that study is the presence of the Church of Scientology. In order for the downtown to sustain growth, you need people living downtown 24-7 and not just seasonal. And many people have expressed concern or fear about church members that flood the area daily. How would you deal with that conclusion, whether it's true or not? Well, again, yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. Ms. Teixeira, you're first. Um, so let me begin with, as a Catholic woman running for, for office, I do believe in the separation of church and state. So when I refer to the Church of Scientology, it's strictly as a stakeholder. As a stakeholder, 
I hold them respond. I hold them accountable like I do everybody else. Be aware of the impact of your footprint and to contribute to your success. As of right now, their presence is divisive, and I need to address it. We all do. Um, it's 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 something that's controversial. It's always in the news. Every time there, it's in the news, it causes it causes friction. So. As a council person, we do have to engage in a conversation. I would like to know what their 10-year plan was, is. I want to know, is it an, is, are their needs in alignment with the rest of the citizens of the city of Clearwater? But complacency is not, an issue, is not an option. It simply isn't. I want to leave you with a quote from Martha Luther King. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is time for vigorous and positive action by Martha Luther King. All we right. can't just leave it aside. All right, thank you. Now, Mr. Bunker. E? Okay. <laughs> so when I talk about Scientology, I'm not talking about the, the people, the members that you see on the streets. These are good, decent, smart people who are really trying to save the planet. I'm talking about the management of Scientology and the actions. The, not the faith, but the actions. So with Scientology, we need transparency and accountability. No more secret meetings with David Miscavige. If they have uh, something to tell us, they need to come in, out in the open to do that. We need to know who owns the more than $113 million worth of properties that were purchased. David Miscavige told the Times, well, we own two, but the others, I don't know. Well, who believes that? I don't think anybody. Um, Miscavige did say the two properties that the church owned uh, were to be, uh, 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 he did promise to put in a movie theater. And he and Tom Cruise were going to recruit that to the area. He should do that. He should put up a non-refundable bond to ensure that he pulls through with that. And uh, you're, out, you're out of time. Thank okay. You so much, sir. Mr. Menino. Thank you. Uh, born and raised in this Clearwater community, uh, devout Catholic, my wife and I. We've knocked on again thousands of doors throughout our, through your community, our community. Eight out of ten doors we knocked on bring up this very subject, Scientology. Eight out of ten. That's being born and raised in the city. It's disheartening and frustrating for me to see where our city is now and where it was. It's almost frozen in time. Okay, our citizens do not come down here, nor do they want to. They have a fear of where they can and can't spend money because they don't want to spend money in a church business. You have to work on changing that perception. Number two, we've held out as Lena is saying, hope. She wants to hold out hope and have people come to the table and let's have conversations and cooperation. <clears throat> We've done that for over 40 years. When does hope disappear? When do you as a city have to start moving forward and say, with us or against us, join us or not, we have to put a strategic plan going forward. And if they're not with us, start enforcing codes. Give your code department the, the power to enforce things. If they're leaving shell buildings vacant, start charging vacancy fees. If they have an intent to pull a business receipt tax, make sure they're operating a business for that right. But we have to protect our citizens and downtown. Appreciate it. Mr. Rector. I'm a member of Calvary Church. I'm not a Scientologist. I'm also a fiscal conservative. And this week, I got to knock on a door and meet John Roper, who's 93 years old, lives by himself, came to his door in a wheelchair. He's a World War II veteran who celebrated his 19th birthday in Iwo Jima, the day that they raised the flag with the famous picture. I am not going to vote to waste tax dollars for a gentleman like that, for a single mom in this community, to fight a war with Scientology. And I'm, I'm all for making sure that, that Scientology does not have control over downtown Clearwater or Clearwater, but let's not waste taxpayer money trying to remove a tax exemption that the city of Clearwater has absolutely no control of removing. I want to respect tax dollars on every issue. Imagine Clearwater, how we address Scientology. Yes, we should know right, what, what they're going to do with their properties, just like we should with right. any other taxpayer. Thank you, Mr. Rector. These are condominiums that are in that area that start at a quarter of a million and up. And my understanding is that they're full up. They're, they are they have no vacancies. So their people want to come down. People want to live here. I think the essence is we need to have affordable housing and we need to use that opportunity zone. We need to do the community redevelopment agency to be able to bring in 
viable, livable, affordable housing within the downtown area, that is going to be the thing that's going to be vibrant. People are coming here, they're paying good money to live here. Let's make sure that the good people can enjoy being here by having an affordable place to live at. It is essential that we use all the tools available and do that development and do it quickly. All right, let's move on to another question. And by the way, if I inadvertently skip any of you, jump up and say, hey, dummy, you skipped me, okay? Uh, I did that once last night. Hopefully I won't do that tonight at all. Clearwater has so many pieces of property that for one reason or other are not taxed in the downtown area. Does that unfairly shift the infrastructure tax burden to the areas outside of the downtown? Mr. Menino, you're first. Well, yes, it absolutely does. And that's a, that's a lot of the frustrations in our community is that when there are so many downtown properties that do not contribute to the tax base, you as citizens carry that burden and that's frustrating and it's not something that just happened overnight it's something that we've witnessed in the last 40 plus years happen so you all, we all pay the basic millage rate but if there are properties that have the ability to make in tax revenues it then alleviates the burden on some of you homeowners so yes absolutely that is an issue that's a problem uh, and our citizens are frustrated i will work hard uh, with the citizens to find ways that we can find things to tax some of those properties. And if they're sitting there empty, let's make sure we start vacancy fees. Let's make sure we're having proper, um, uh, sorry, let, let's ensure that there's proper use going on in a building. If they're saying they have a business tax receipt to do business, it's not taxable, ensure that it's operating that way and that it's not a shell. We have to help some of our citizens in the community with that tax rate, and that's how it can be done. Mr. Rector, same question for you. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, we, we've talked a lot last night and tonight about downtown and a lot about Scientology. When, when I talk to people out in neighborhoods all over Clearwater, they, they care about their own neighborhoods, their streets and roads. They care about jobs. They care about education. The number one thing they talk to me about is traffic congestion. And, and that's where I want to focus our tax money and time. I, I, we need a plan for reducing traffic congestion that benefits all of our residents. We have the highest, at the last census, Clearwater had the highest percentage of its population age 65 and over of any city in the United States. It makes it very hard for folks to get around to the grocery, so on and so forth. It makes it hard for public safety to get to them when they need, they need help. We need to focus our tax money on all of Clearwater and, and benefiting all of Clearwater. All right, thank you. Mr. Santana. We definitely need to increase the amount of taxable properties that we have. But even more than that, we need to develop the properties that we have so that they will produce the maximum amount of taxes because they're being developed to the greatest use. It is, this is where we have to use, and this sounds like a record, we need to utilize the financial tools available to be able to bring about affordable housing, bring about that development of the businesses, not just in the downtown area that desperately needs that, but also in North Greenwood area and in other parts of the city that can use that development because we it's not that we don't have enough untaxable properties, is that we have not developed the properties we have to its fullest and we need to utilize all of these tools, my 30 years of experience with the Sheriff's Department has taught me how to utilize funds and to be able to account for these things. It is essential that we use all of the tools available to spark this economics that we have here. All right, thank you. Mr. Shera. The fact is that these properties are empty and they're empty for years. And that is a burden we've carried for a long time. So they might be paying property tax, but we're losing a lot and by being vacant. If they were businesses, it would be filling the coffers. Now, one of the only benefits of being a city that's sort of lagging behind everybody, there's a silver lining in that. We can actually learn from our neighboring cities that have succeeded. And one of the things that St. Pete implemented was finding property owners that have left vacant properties. And they retaliated and rented it out for a dollar, and then all of a sudden the artists came in and voila, Central Avenue was born. So we can look to our neighboring uh, cities for, for, for guidance. They, it's, they've succeeded. Leaving this 
just ignored is just it's just a burden that I'm unwilling to carry anymore. All right, thank you, Mr. Bunker. I'm not trying to start a war with Scientology, but just to be clear, when they snuck into town uh, uh, back in '75, they ran covert operations to take over the city. So if there is a war, that's already on, and we're just too frightened to admit it. Um, when we when we look at uh, Scientology. Uh, brags about how much money they pay in property taxes downtown. Well, yeah, but 72% of their properties are not taxable. And we really need to do something about that. We need to find out what they're going to do with the $113 million worth of buildings. And as was mentioned before, uh, if they're planning to just use it to sabotage Imagine Clearwater, we need to start finding the owners of any buildings that are left vacant. And if it goes on for too long, we might have to consider eminent domain. All right, let's move on to some other questions here now. One of the main criticisms of Clearwater City Council, and this comes from current and past council members, is that it takes forever to make any kind of decision, and that even after paying for consultants many thousands of dollars, many of those recommendations are ignored. Is that good fiscal policy, Mr. Menino? No, absolutely not. Um, and again, this is a frustration for many in our community. Our city spends hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on survey after survey after survey. We ask for your input as citizens, and I think many times it goes in one year and out the other. The problem in our city is inclusion, and so often you're not included until the back end of a project is almost completed. What happens when you're included in the back end of the project is what you're witnessing in Imagine Clearwater or in the strong mayorship or the appointing of Jay Polglaze was all of a sudden the citizens wake up, start using their voice and showing their frustrations with the city. We have to find a way to change the culture in this city as elected officials to promote inclusion to where the citizens drive the vision and the desires of this city via policies and how your tax, tax dollars are spent, and that'll start immediately if I'm elected. Mr. Rector. Could you repeat the question? Again? The question was, and one of the criticisms of the Clearwater City Council is that it takes forever to make a decision, and that even after paying for consultants, many of those recommendations are ignored. Is that good fiscal policy? As a council member, I, as I said a minute ago, I will not tolerate government waste. We've had We've had news reports on different departments with uh, embezzlement. We've had uh, events that weren't run very efficiently and, and the city lost money on. Uh, we, uh, when I went to the work session on Imagine Clearwater, as uh, like, um, another candidate said, uh, one of the things they said that they were proposing $800 chairs for the, the amphitheater. Um, the, th these are things we can't tolerate throughout the city at all. And I agree with <laughs> with uh, Mr. Menino that we have got to listen more carefully to our residents. Instead of waiting for them to come to a library or city hall to tell us what their neighborhoods are and the needs, we've got to go into the neighborhoods and talk to them in their neighborhoods about their problems and their challenges and what they want for our community. And I can assure you this is not an $800 chair that I'm sitting <laughs> right now. <laughs> My bun bun fell asleep 20 minutes ago. Okay. Mr. Santana, the same question. You know, it's, it's a fundamental principle that we live, in a, it, we live in a republic that is representative. When I sit here in the city council seat, I am here listening to what the people are saying, listening to what everybody that's a stakeholder is saying, and acting accordingly. When you have all these surveys that you're paying all these consultations and you're having all these things that are happening, you're looking, they're fishing for what they want to hear. They're not necessarily want to hear what is the truth. They're fishing for what is here. I will hear what the homeowners association is saying. I will hear what you want and I will act accordingly to make sure that that happens because I am here to be a service to my community, to be a service to my city, to be your servant and not to be your teller of what I want. I'm listening. Mr. Sheriff. So in my various roles, I have been very frustrated in communicating 
the frustrations of the people who have elected me. And I have felt unheard. And in that capacity, I have relayed our concerns and felt unheard myself. And so we get to this stage where um, we're questioning everything that's told to us. We don't feel, we, we feel disenfranchised. And as a private citizen and as a leader of several um, organizations, I've seen it firsthand. And we have studies, which I have addressed as well, that have faulty data. And this data skews the results. And that's dangerous. We're making decisions based on faulty data. And if I, as a private citizen, can look at a report and within 10 minutes find out that the parking numbers are wrong, the seat dimensions are wrong, and the full-time estimates are wrong, I, I question the validity of the whole paper, the whole study, which we've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for, and we're making million-dollar decisions on. Right. So, right. definitely. Thank concern. you. Mr. Bunker. Yes, uh, we, we do need to listen to the people. Uh, so, when we say we, this is what we want from the park, we shouldn't be going beyond that. Uh, when I, I uh, when I hear about uh, paying for all these uh, plans, the Urban Land Institute came here to uh, to talk about our downtown and what we should do. What they said is, we looked at all the other ten proposals that you paid for. These were all great. Do those, but the most important thing is you've got to work together with Scientology, and the city tried, and we got stabbed in the back again. We refused to sell uh, the aquarium lot to. Uh, the aquarium refused to sell it to Scientology. They sold it to the city instead. So Scientology then started their secret plan to buy up all the downtown property, mainly in cash, uh, to do what? Sabotage the project? So if we're not in a war, <laughs> that sure seemed like an attack on the city to me. All right, let's move on to another question. And we're getting down to the point. We'll only have a couple more questions left, but they're, they're all goodies. Here's another one. A lot of criticism from folks who live on Clearwater Beach or in Countryside or in the Greenwood area or other parts of the city say, hey, you are spending so much time talking about downtown. What happened to us? What's your answer to that, Mr. Rector? That's what I hear a lot, uh, going door to door, talking to folks. Uh, and it's not that people don't care about downtown. I want a vibrant downtown. I think we all do. Uh, I want us to improve our waterfront. Uh, I think we all do. Um, but, but let's not lose sight of the things that matter, the core services of government that apply to every citizen in Clearwater. Uh, they care about traffic congestion, which is a significant problem. The county has just come out in October, September, October, with a plan um, uh, to uh, do lots of things with, with timing of lights and, and a, a combination of different things to make our traffic congestion better. We need to focus on that for the benefit of all our communities. Jobs, we need economic development. We are very, very heavily focused in jobs on the tourism industry. That works great at a booming economy. It may not work, work great if the economy starts to stagger. We need to diversify our economy. Right. We need jobs. Thank you so much. Mr. Santana, same question. You know, when, as a city, as a citizen of this city, we're looking at spending $64 million on a, on a downtown development project. And if implemented in the way that it is now, we're still gonna be on the hook for the five, first five years, we're gonna lose like over $5 million in operate, and that's if it's operating correctly. So I have concerns because there are many parts of our city that need, can, can you just imagine where we could spend $64 million in our city, in, in Greenwood area, in countryside, staffing, staffing the countryside uh, firehouse to be able to be fully staffed and respond to people. It is essential that we look at that and we need to spend our money on our infrastructure, making sure that Things work across the city because this is a beautiful place and I want to make sure that the money is spent wisely and keeping our city vibrant. Mr. Sheriff. There is a definite disconnect between neighborhoods. I go to Greenwood and they feel the same way about Countryside. Countryside feels the same way about Morningside. There's all this conflict and disconnect. And there's a story I've said and I'll make it short. My husband and I went to two cons and we're sitting at the bar and there's a bunch of people next to me. 
And of course, some of them are tourists. And they ask the person next to me, where are you from? St. Pete, they answer. They ask the couple next to me, where are you from? Dunedin. Then they ask the person, a court, a, a catty corner to me, and they said, countryside. They were the only ones that didn't identify themselves as citizens of Clearwater, but rather their neighborhood. We need to change that. We need to be unified. We need to treat all the neighborhoods equally, but we need to identify ourselves as citizens of Clearwater who happens to live in a certain neighborhood. It's something we need to fix. Divided, we're not strong. Mr. Bunker. Yeah. I, uh, I'm surprised that the beach feels neglected, um, but I suppose that's the case. We do talk a lot about downtown, and we certainly talked a lot about it tonight. Uh, we do need to make sure that all of our neighborhoods are taken care of. $64 million. How many homes could be painted? How many porches could be fixed? How many roofs could we repair? You know, we do have programs in place for folks who need assistance, whether it's to buy uh, a, a home for the first time or whether it's to make some repairs to your own property. Uh, we need to, to make sure that that's available. Um, we need to make sure that we're listening to the people and not developers, because developers, they can get money like that. Um, we need to actually think more about what the people need. Okay, Mr. Menino, did I give you a time on this? Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, Al. Finally, four, 50 minutes into the question, and we're talking about your community and your neighborhoods. This is, uh, this is about time. We've still left out the environment, which deserves another four hours, but we'll, we'll take what time's left. Our communities are screaming for some attention and representation. For seven to ten years, citizen apathy has crippled the city of Clearwater. Us as voters, we fell asleep at the wheel and have not paid much attention to the P word of politics. You know who always does? Special interest groups. That's their job. They're not going anywhere. When they're the only ones at City Hall in the years of their elected officials, your policies in the direction of your city is going to end up going that way. It's on us as citizens, as you're doing, engaging in this process, to wake up and demand a voice. And you're starting to do that. I commend you all for doing that. But you have to be respected and listened to and included in the conversation. I promise as an elected official that we will find balance again in our community. And we will balance livability and destination, your quality of life with tourism. So let me ask a question from, from all of you, and I just want to see a, a show of hands. And I realize that any time you ask candidates, they'll always go, but, 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 I don't want any buts, okay? <laughs> Do, would you be in favor of adding a 12 or a 24-hour rescue response unit to the countryside area? Raise your hands if you'd be in favor of that. Okay, thank, thank you very much. The police union currently in a green negotiating their contract with the city and soon the firefighters union doing the same. What are their demands? And can the city afford to return to compensation levels unions say they agreed to when times were fiscally tough? Mr. Rector, let me start with you. Uh, public safety is a high priority for me and for the citizens of Clearwater. As I said earlier, we have a, uh, a large elderly population. We also have a high tourism volume. So our first responders, the quality of our fire department and the quality of our police department are more important to this community, I would argue, than maybe any other in Florida. They need to be fairly compensated for the work that they do. They, we need the highest quality we can get, and they've had to make concessions in the past that have not been returned to them. Uh, we need to do whatever it takes to allow them to be able to offer compensation to officers and firefighters who will attract the best and brightest uh, police and fire department we can have. All right, Mr. Santana. You know, I, I was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I was like, uh, I'm concerned about it. And so I reached out, and the reality is that we are not in negotiations uh, for a uh, contract for either the firefighter or the police. We're in the middle of a contract. It's going to be a, like two years before we have to approach that. But the city has talked to uh, about the COLA, the retirement, the cost of living uh, that had to do with was removed uh, about over 10 years ago uh, and when we were in economic straits. And they've negotiated and they've come to an understanding. And, my, and, my, and that is going to be carried out. But it's a good thing that right now we don't have to worry about that, that issue 
uh, for a while. And I will tell you that it's important for us to take care of our law enforcement and our firefighters because when we dial 911, I want them to show up and I want them to respond. And, I, and, and too many of them, as mentioned before, have to live outside of this area. We need to make sure that we have affordable housing so that they can stay here. Mr. Sheriff. As a nurse, I understand the grueling work and challenging work of, of being a first responder. It taxes on you and, and it's a very difficult job and not everybody can do it. And these people agreed to concessions when we needed them to during the recession. We're no longer in recession. And so that needs to be fixed. We need to honor the people who take care of us. It's as simple as that. Mr. Bunker. Back in 2008, when the economy collapsed, I was working at XCTV in uh, San Diego. And I saw what happened inside the newsroom. We had a very vibrant, exciting place to work with tons of people, reporters, editors, photographers, uh, writers, producers, all coming together to make a newscast that was worth something. And when the economy died, cutbacks, cutbacks, cutbacks. Every week people were, were fired. And when the station found out that they could put on a newscast, not as good, but with just a handful of people, well, there was no going back. And that can't be the case with our police officers or firefighters. They made concessions. They deserve, now that we've made, uh, been made whole, that they be made whole. Mr. Menino. Absolutely, Al, thank you. Uh, I've proudly been endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police, your Clearwater Firefighters Association, and the Sierra Club. I greatly understand this issue that we're discussing. Let's make sure, for, for clarity, we understand that there's two different components of this negotiation. Police had a reduction in their multiplier, in their pension plan. Fire had a reduction in their cost of living. That was in 2012. Hard times financially led to that. City came to them. Would you be willing to help us? Your men and women in uniform said, yes, I will help our tax-paying citizens of this. As long as once this economy gets back on track, you will do that same to us. Here we are in 2020. Think your economy is doing pretty well. Police and fire coming back to the table and saying, what about us? It's our turn now. Are we willing? And we need to be willing. We have not taken that extra step to support them. I will do everything I can in this community to not only support your men and women and first responders in uniform, we need to take care of our teachers, our nurses, our school systems, our communities, our neighborhoods, and you, the citizens. We need to bring balance back to your community. All right, show of hands. How many of you think we should raise taxes in Clearwater? <laughs> Just wanted to make sure there was a heartbeat in the room. <laughs> I wish we had more time because I had about 20 more questions I probably couldn't get in. Uh, especially on the environment and a couple of other things, and I apologize, we just don't have enough time. But you already had six meetings with people, and so now is the time for your closing statements. You'll each have a minute, and uh, then after that point, we'll give you a round of applause, and we'll figure out what's going on after that. We are doing them in reverse order, so Lena Teixeira, you are first. Okay, so you've listened to us interviewing for our job, and you've listened how wonderful we are. But um, in all seriousness, there's an important decision to be made. You all have to decide who do you want to add to the existing um, council right now in this very critical point. If you're looking for someone who's a polished politician, who's looking at this as a career move, a stepping stone, that's not me. I need to finish what I started. As a private citizen, I've done so much. As a recent empty nester, I'm ready to double down. Allow me to finish what I started. I have so much more to do, and I need your help. I need you to vote for Lena Teixeira and see what it's like to have a woman with passion, conviction, and commitment be up there representing you all. Thank all right, you. Thank you. Eliseo Santana. Oh. You know, in my military service as a veteran, I learned leadership. I learned how to bring people together and work get that spree, that team going, because whenever we were divided, it would not work. With my over 30 years of experience with the sheriff department as an administrator, I learned budgeting. I learned the processes of being able to control and, and make sure that our money is spent wisely and is accounted for. We, just recently, we've had over a half a million dollars that just bloop in the city through mismanagement, 
through outright fraud. We need to make sure that we, that half a million could be used in so many different ways. And through the League of Women Voters as the vice president, I learned how to listen. And I'm going to listen to your needs and I'm gonna act upon them, not tell you what I think you should do, ask you, what is it that I should do? All right, thank you, Mr. Santana. Bruce Rector, you have a minute now. Something for that question where we got to answer things where we didn't get to talk about. So I just want to cover three real quick. One, it's important that this city collaborate to be successful going forward. We don't run the schools, but we sure need to know what's going on in the Clearwater City Schools that are part of Pinellas County Schools and collaborate and help to make them successful. Healthcare, we have a significant mental health crisis, not just in Clearwater, but across the United States, but definitely in Clearwater, and a drug problem and we need to collaborate with hospitals, mental health professionals to address that problem. And the third thing is our environment. We need to collaborate like they do at Ocean Allies, which is pulling together businesses to try to improve and protect our environment. We need to work together in all kinds of ways throughout this community. If you elect me a city council member, I'll be a good listener, I'll respect your ideas, and I will make sure that every dollar of your taxpayer money is carefully and wisely and productively productively spit. I'm Bruce Rector, and I'd be honored to have your vote on March 17th. All right, thank you, sir, very much. Mike Menino. Thank you. Michael Mike Menino, it'll be on your ballot, so <laughs> I'll, I'll let him pronounce it however he wants. He's a professional at what he does. Thank, thank you all so much for being here. This is vitally important that we engage in our local politics. That is the future of policies that drive everything you do as a family, as a business and as a citizen. It's the protection of your communities. It's the vibrancy of your downtown. I was born and raised in the city of Clearwater. My wife and I are devout Catholics. I have a master's degree in public administration and a concentration in organizational leadership. I serve as your chairperson for your charter review committee in 2019. I'm on the citizens advisory committee for Ford Pinellas. I sit on your Clearwater Municipal Code Board here at this very thing. I'm on the board of directors for the ARC of Tampa Bay. I work tirelessly for our nonprofit of Finish Lines for Scholarships, taking care of our youth. I've been a coach and a mentor for soccer playing athletes for 33 years. I serve the entirety of this community, and none of it has anything to do with myself other than self-fulfillment and service from my heart. If you elect me, Mike Menino, I will make sure that we bring a balance back to your city and a balance of your quality of life and tourism and destination, as well as responsibility towards our environment. Thank you, Mr. Menino. Mr. Bunker. I think I've mentioned Scientology once or twice tonight. Um, the reason I, I, I have is because for decades the city has been afraid to say the word. And we do need to deal with this. Um, I would like to see us have uh, a day or two of hearings on Scientology. Not about the abuses that are covered in uh, Leah Remini's Scientology in the aftermath. Uh, or going clear. Those are all well known. But I, I'd like to see uh, some questions and answers for the city. W what does the police department need to know when dealing with Scientology? How about uh, code enforcement? I think that would be constructive. I have uh, tried for years now to tell the board uh, that uh, uh, they should talk to Mike Rinder, who used to be a former executive and knows how David Miscavige uh, thinks, um, and they've refused. That's why I've decided to step up and put a target on my back and, and run. Right. And I'm the clear choice for seat two. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was slick, I will admit that. Uh, candidates, thank you so much. So audience, you've been very patient behind me, so let's give them all a round of applause, shall we? All right, candidates, you need to scoot out of the way, and we're going to move in four more candidates for council seat number three, and we'll be back in about five minutes with more. And don't forget to vote for...
Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm Al Rochelle. This is our third and final debate, and this is for City Council Seat 3. And as you know, if you're a resident of Clearwater, these are all at-large seats. Now, that doesn't mean the seat's any wider. It just means that everybody gets to vote, and they'll be picking one from each of the categories. We had the mayor's race, where you'll pick one. We had Council Seat 2, where you'll pick one of the five candidates. You'll be selecting one of the four people that have graced our stage today. So thank you so very much, candidates. The same rules of the game. One minute, the little yellow buttons, he means you got 15 seconds, the red button, we're not going to let it go beep, 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 like it sometimes does. It'll just go flash, 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 and if you speak more than five seconds over, I'll kind of go, and then we'll just be moving on. Uh, audience, I know you're going to be good. You were great during all of the last debates, but please no snickering, no throwing of tomatoes, no commenting about the, how my hair looks from behind, uh, none of that kind of stuff. Just be calm, enjoy the debate. Uh, we're going to ask as many questions as we can. The order of opening statements will be alphabetical, and then the closing statements will be the reverse order, so everybody gets a chance to answer the questions. I will call out the name of the individual that needs to answer each one of the questions. So uh, let's right start out with the very beginning with our opening statements. Kathleen Beckman, you go first. Thank you. So why am I running? Yes. Good question. OK. I'm running because Clearwater deserves better. I want to raise the bar on what it means to be a council member in Clearwater. You know, it was well over a year that I decided to run for Clearwater City Council. And why? Because I saw that residents and families were not being represented on our council. I've stood at that podium right there and numerous times uh, to speak for things that are important to people who live and work here and the council is not listening. We need someone who will advocate for residents and raise the bar on what that means. I have the time energy, passion, and experience as a lifelong public servant and hands-on volunteer to do that. My experiences working with individuals one-on-one -on -one and side-by-side -side has shaped my priorities. We must do better for our families and our environment. I know I can truly make a difference. If you want more from your city council, if you want leadership, action, clear goals, and accountability and transparency, Please vote for me. No one will work harder for you. Thank you. Candidates will add 15 seconds to all ears, okay? Which is fine. We're not going to, we have time this evening. Bob Cundiff, please, your opening statement for us. Thank you very much, Al. It's good to be here with each of you this evening. Uh, of the um, 13 candidates that you've heard last night and tonight, uh, I'm the only candidate that was actually a council member, uh, have been representing the city of Clearwater, the residents of Clearwater, these last four years. And I've done it joyfully and happily. Uh, I didn't quite get into it happily. Uh, a fellow asked me, and I'm a college teacher, have been for many, many years, uh, why don't you run for city council? And what I actually did was laugh at him. <laughs> uh, but then I said, well, let me think about it. I had a little extra time on my hands and uh, for various uh, reasons. And by the end of the year, I decided to run for office. And these last four years have been a joy, uh, meeting so many of you, being in, in so many different neighborhoods, and I hope to continue that for uh, a lot, my last four years. All right, Mr. Kind of thank you so much. Bud Elias, you've got about a minute and five or ten seconds, so go ahead. Thank you very much, Al, and thank all of you for staying here uh, for the second hour. Uh, <laughs> I've lived uh, with my family in Clearwater for a long time. Uh, our kids went to school here. Our kids worshipped here. We worshipped here. We set up and have a successful business here. And for the past 43 years, I've been involved in community organizations in a leadership capacity. I'm a candidate for seat three. My commitment is to the betterment of our neighborhoods, our downtown, and to the safety and well-being of our neighbors is paramount. So for a long time, I've been on the outside looking in, and I'm troubled by what I see. I see a lack of fiscal responsibility, troubled by the lack of communication between and among our neighborhoods in downtown Clearwater, concerned about the dramatic change that will take place when our city manager and city attorney retire. So it's time to put up or shut up, and I thought I better put up. So I'm a candidate, so thank you very much. All right, thank you. And our last candidate, Scott Thomas. Good evening, and I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come out and listen to us tonight and take part of democracy. 
I'm running because I believe that Clearwater needs visionary leadership. Someone who is not going to look for the next four years, but look into the next few decades. I believe that right now we need fiscal responsibility more than ever in our city. We need to cut the red tape of businesses and encourage businesses to come into our city. We also need to start listening to our neighborhoods. Right now, so many neighborhoods feel as though they're left out and they feel as though their city leaders aren't listening and they have a right to feel that way. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you so much. All right, now some of the questions. Now, of course, were all of you listening the last round? Shame on you. No, that's all right, you're allowed to. So, uh, what's the goal of the $64 million Imagine Clearwater project? Is that money well spent, or would you like to see that entire project changed or scrapped altogether? Mr. Elias, you first. Well, I think the purpose of Imagine Clearwater is to provide a destination not only for the citizens of Clearwater, but for people across the country. We're talking about a unique place in the city of Clearwater. We're talking about uh, a place that is on the, on the waterfront that uh, other cities would like to have and do not have. Uh, I think it's going to be a commitment that we are going to say that we're going to do something that's unique for the city of Clearwater where people from all across the country will come and enjoy that facility. Uh, in terms of its economic uh, process right now, I think that we have to be careful uh, in terms of the dollars that we spend. But uh, by, the, by the same token, I think it's, it's an opportunity for us to have an economic engine that's going to make a difference in downtown, it's going to make a difference in the periphery of the park, and that in itself will bring business and commercial organizations to downtown, which is something we've been talking about for a long time. All right, Mr. Thomas. Imagine Clearwater has many pros but it also has many cons. It gives the city a chance to revitalize and put something on the waterfront that can be family friendly and bring people in from other areas of the state and the country. But there's also concerns that I don't feel as though the council has fully thought out. We hired uh, consultants and paid $41,000 to uh, rec make a recommendation on the project and the city council decided not to take their word on that. Um, I believe that the project as it was voted on is not the project as you see today. I believe that it needs to go back to the voters for a referendum because the costs continue to rise and we need to be fiscally responsible and I don't see the uh, graduation of this project being that. Ms. Beckman. <clears throat> I think uh, Imagine Clearwater is a great idea. I voted for it as far as the development of that park for the residents and for families. I did not vote for a 4,000 seat covered amphitheater. That was not part of it. Nor did I vote for anything that was articulated as, a, as an attraction for the entire nation. I thought it was for residents and families, and that's what I've advocated for. I think it's a beautiful venue that should be enjoyed by everyone here who lives here in Clearwater, but the price tag is much too high. We need to look at the environmental impact of all that building down there. Um, I was here in this room when consultants made their presentations about what sort of venue would work for Imagine Clearwater, and they did not recommend a 4,000 covered seat. They had numerous PowerPoint slides of other venues in the area, but they recommended like 21 to 2,400. We need to, it needs to be a destination for residents and families first. We could reconvene a stakeholders group, including residents, to refocus our priorities and get that budget down. Thank you. Mr. Kondo. Uh Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm the guy who's getting all the heat probably tonight because I voted uh, to try to follow the referendum, which we had, and the uh, the folks that we had do the research for us and uh, what they came up with was a 22 acre park right now coachman park is about six acres uh, the park is going to go from from drew street down to pierce avenue uh, it's going to be 22 acres uh, right now we have uh, half of that is parking lot we don't want a parking lot we want a park and that parking lot is going to be green uh, as is Coachman Park and is going to remain green and the space below City Hall uh, will not be. And my time's about gone, but uh, uh, 
I'll, I'll have to talk later about the concert venue. All right, let's move on. Is there any concrete measurable evidence that changing the street structure along Cleveland Street, reducing the lane sizes with concrete curbs, limited carve-outs for parking, has had any positive impact in that area or the rest of the city of Clearwater? Mr. Thomas. I don't believe it has. I, I, when, as I talk to people who do go downtown, many people mm -hmm. say that it's, it's more of a hazard than it is than it was before. Um, with all the zigzags that you have to go through, I think that that's a deterrent. Um, so, no, I don't think there is a simple answer. Ms. Beckman. No, I don't think there is either. I've talked to the merchants on Cleveland Street. They don't like that traffic calming, um, jagged drive driving there. Um, they also wish we didn't have metered parking on Cleveland Street. Um, I think it's disrupted the flow uh, there, and we can do better to to engage more business if it were uh, a friendlier street, you know, I mean, if we didn't have the traffic calming. Um. Okay, Mr. Cundiff. Uh, I'm all in favor of, of making uh, most of Cleveland a walkable area. Uh, we as a city council haven't really talked about it. We've had a lot of other things on our plate, but I'm certainly willing to investigate it and to uh, see if that's a possibility. Okay, Mr. Elias. Uh, I would I would agree that uh, we need to have a walkable capability for downtown. I think the original intent was to beautify the downtown and to encourage businesses to come down and, and uh, offer their services. Uh, unfortunately, we have an awful lot of empty storefronts, and consequently, uh, people are not coming down on that street. They're not spending their time, and there's obviously no no reason for them to come down in terms of business. So that's that's an issue. So. Are we trying to create another Dunedin, another Safety Harbor, another St. Petersburg, a 20-year overnight sensation? What is the goal for Clearwater, Ms. Beckman? I think the goal for Clearwater, and are you asking just for downtown? But I Clearwater want to know the whole field. What, yeah. So more than just downtown? Yes. I think the goal for Clearwater is to make it you know, I think about what do we want to be known for in Clearwater? And, and I think we want to be known uh, for taking care of our residents and protecting our environment. And I think taking care of our residents means meeting the needs of people in, our, in all of our communities. And they have a, a wide variety of needs. If we talk about downtown, perhaps we can develop it to be a sense of unity and community for all of our, our different neighborhoods. And I think by having um, a nice park that we can go to, residents that I've talked to have mentioned a children's museum downtown, an indoor farmer's market. They want a family-friendly venue to unite us and bring us together. And I think that's a great opportunity for downtown to bring in everyone from Clearwater and build a sense of unity there. Mr. Cundiff? Uh, Clearwater has a lot of downtowns. Uh, we have, what, 100 square miles of, uh, uh, of residents and businesses uh, along Highway 19, along Gulf to Bay. Uh, there are plenty of business districts. Downtown Clearwater is uh, the county seat, and it's also the place where the sit most of the city government is as well, uh, and historically has been uh, the, the old downtown of Clearwater. Uh, historic, wonderful. Uh, right now, we're seeing some blight and uh, w with the uh, community redevelopment area, we're trying to um, get rid of that blight and make it a vibrant downtown. One of the goals of the uh, expanded Coachman Park was uh, to help in the revitalization effort. Mm -hmm. Mr. Elias. For the past several months, I've been uh, making phone calls and talking to residents in our community and asking them if they spend any time in, in Clearwater. And uh, people from Countryside or people from Mor uh, Morningside or any of the other neighborhoods. And the response is, not very often, if not at all. And my question was, if you don't go downtown, if there's no reason to spend time in downtown, if we had a destination, as an example, a steakhouse located in a position where parking was on the periphery of the, of the building and it was a well-known steakhouse, would you go downtown? And the answer was yes. And my next question was, if we developed the park and it became the destination, it was a green space where people could bring their families and enjoy the amenities, would they come down? And they said yes. 
So we can't be a, 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 another Dundee, and we can't be a safety harbor. We are unique in terms of who we are. We need to find a way for, for people to say, let's, let's spend time in our community. Mr. Thomas. Yes. The city of Clearwater is well known for America's number one beach. We should take pride in that. But obviously, that's not the only part of our city. We need to make sure that we are looking at other communities, not because we want to resemble them, but because just because it's our idea doesn't mean it's the best idea. And the best way to learn about what works is to visit other communities, whether that be Safety Harbor, whether that be Dunedin, whether that be somewhere else in the state or around the country. Um, we can't think that we know it all. So I think it's important to, to look outside the box and think outside the box to come up with a plan that will make Clearwater the number one city, not only in the county, not only in the state, but in our country. All right. Now, we are not here tonight to argue for or against the Church of Scientology. I am talking about policy issues. If the city is going to grow, a study commissioned by this, the city says that you need people living downtown year-round, not just seasonal. Given people's fear of the presence of Scientology and also steep rental and purchase prices, is that even possible? And we'll start up with Ms. Beckman. Is that even possible to get people to come downtown? Yes, w with housing prices being high and the fear of Scientology. Well, I understand that there's a, a lot of um, occupancy in the apartment buildings that are already downtown. When I talk to people about revitalizing downtown, um, I suggest that if you want it to be revitalized, you need to get down there and visit the merchants and the restaurants that are downtown. Um, I. I don't think we need to be intimidated or bullied by any one entity that we think is down there doing something um, that makes us uncomfortable. Um, it's our down. It's it's our city. Uh, we need to go down there and enjoy it, and and really reward those merchants who have put their neck on the line and are operating businesses and support them. Um, how else are we going to make it attractive for future entrepreneurs and businesses to come down there? Mm -hmm. Mr. Cundiff. During the last four years, we have been moving toward more affordable housing, uh, either in or near downtown. Uh, within uh, a couple of blocks uh, um, north on uh, Garden Street is an 84-unit uh, affordable housing uh, apartment building. Uh, just south of that, closer to the city, uh, we built an entire 12 or 13-unit uh, neighborhood with Habitat for Humanity homes all of those built with sweat labor by working working people. Uh, Apex 1100, uh, one, 11, uh, 1100, Apex 1100, I think it is, uh, op has opened up. It's not, it, it's luxury apartments, but it's hundreds of apartments uh, that are, are cheaper than the condos because they are rentals. Uh, across, across the street, uh, also apartments have opened up in Nolan, also not cheap, but downtown, We've just uh, voted a couple of weeks ago for an, uh, a plus, 80 plus uh, unit of affordable housing. Okay. Mr. Elias. When I go to Dunedin, and when people from Clearwater go to Dunedin, we see people everywhere, on the streets, on the sidewalks, weekends, and I think, why can't we have that kind of activity in downtown Clearwater? One of the issues, I think, is the fact that we have so many people who are working on the beach and working in downtown. They live in Pasco County. They live in Hillsborough County. They have to travel all of that time to come down here where there are no living accommodations. So I think the issue of affordable housing is significant, and we need to be able to say, let's bring people downtown. We have, we have the luxury apartments. We have the, the high-end living accommodations, let's begin to take care of those people who serve us every single day and, and bring them downtown so that we have a thriving downtown like the other communities that surround us. Right. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Professionally, I work as a senior human resources director for a long-term care facility. So I see every day, I give people jobs, that's what I do for a living. Um, so I see people where the people come from. And like many others said, uh, many of them come from outside of the area, Pasco County, Hillsboro even, because they can't afford to live in Clearwater. It's important that we do something about affordable housing um, in our downtown and throughout the city itself. 
we need to make sure that um, we are giving incentives for developers that want to build um, complexes that would um, portionize some of the some of the uh, units to affordable housing. I think that's key to the success of bringing people downtown because they all can't afford a luxury apartment. Right. All right. Another topic. We had a big flap recently over the possibility that Scientology members could dominate an important development committee. Given the fact that the church or its members are the biggest single property holders in downtown, what role should they play in city government? Mr. Cundiff. Well, uh, anybody can run for office. Uh, I've never seen any interest by Scientologists to run for office. They usually stay away from it. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, what you're asking here. Uh, we are all residents. We all vote. Uh, any resident who's registered to vote can vote, no matter what church they go to. Uh, and, and I think that um, uh, Scientologists can own businesses just like anybody else. Uh, Scientologists can buy property just like anybody else. People complain, uh, why do you allow people to buy property? Well, Anybody can buy property. There's no law against it. Um, and you wouldn't want one against it, against the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but, but uh, people who live and work in Clearwater need to be involved in government and in uh, uh, business organizations as well. We have some of the largest businesses uh, downtown Clearwater. Mm -hmm. Mr. Elias. Well, I'm not aware that there's any provision in the Charter that says that anyone can run, cannot run for a public office. Uh, <clears throat> that includes all the stakeholders in downtown, that includes the church, that includes the Presbyterian church, the Catholics, and the Jewish synagogues, and people who belong to those communities. So in terms of uh, anyone being involved in the city of Clearwater and its, its uh, government, uh, it's open to anyone. And I, I see no reason why anyone should be excluded from that. Okay. Mr. Thomas? I believe that mm -hmm. in the separation of church and state, with that being said, I also believe that um, everyone has the right to run for office, just like every, all 13 candidates are this year. Um, I also believe that every stakeholder in downtown should be treated the same. Um, we shouldn't be giving any special exceptions to anyone in downtown Clearwater, and we should be giving the same uh, type of meetings or anything like that with any business or any entity that comes our way requesting a meeting. So let me ask a follow-up to that question. So, Wait. oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Beckman, yeah, yeah, right. Because I have a little anecdote to There you go, <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, uh, I kind of echo the same responses. If, so your question is, what role should Scientologists play, if any, in government? Um, they're free to run for any office or, or apply to be on any board, and, and that's fine. Um, I, I was contacted by a Scientologist who operates the Gelato, um, restaurant here downtown and she called me in and I she wanted to talk to me she knew I was a candidate and so I sat down with her for about an hour in her little gelato shop and she essentially said you know I I want to run my shop I want to have business but people come in here and somebody whispers and says it's owned by a Scientologist and everybody goes out and so she had her story she told me her story and it was emotional and and compelling and I simply told her listen you need to go before the council you're given three minutes to talk about items that aren't on the agenda and tell your story put a face to your story let people know how you feel and that's what engagement is with a government and anybody can do that regardless of their religion and I just would offer that advice to anyone who wants to play a role okay another topic one of the many criticisms of Clearwater City Council and of course many you know whatever uh, even from some of its members is that it takes forever to make a decision and that even after paying for consultants as Mr. Thomas pointed out many of those recommendations are ignored is that good fiscal policy? Mr. Cundiff, I ask you that question. I would say no, it's not good fiscal policy, but I, I would also say that we get criticized when we, when we find experts to help us, uh, whether we follow them or not. Uh, and I, I do my best and have done my best in the last four years uh, to follow the advice of the experts as well as all of the input that, uh, that uh, you folks as residents have. Uh, uh, that is very, very important. Uh, uh, 
I ran four years ago saying we have too many consultants. Uh, and so I've asked over the last couple of years, why do we have so many consultants? Well, because we don't have that expert, well, we have some of that expertise on our staff, but they would have to stop doing what they're doing uh, in order to do that uh, extra project that was laid upon them, and we don't have that big of a staff to do that. Okay, Mr. Elias. I've been following the city council for many, many years, and I would like to have a dollar for every study that has been commissioned by the, by the city council. My, my feeling is that uh, a study is engaged and they, they pay a consultant forty, fifty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 for that, for that study, and then the study is put into a hermetically sealed jar, <laughs> and then it's put into a dark closet where it stays for two or three years. And then three or four years down the road, the city says, well, we need to re-engage that study. Let's spend another thirty dollars or $40,000 on another study to revise that study. So we are studied to death. My, my concern is that there is no initiative. The city needs to be decisive in terms of what it's doing. Don't put it off. Don't put off making decisions by virtue of having studies after study after study. Mr. Thomas. I would agree with what Mr. Elias said. And I start, that's what I start out with in the Imagine Clearwater question. We paid $41,000 to Web Consulting, who was a good consulting firm, and we didn't listen to them anyway. That's just one example. So I think that we do studies to study the study. That, that shouldn't be the way it is. And then at the end of the day, half the time, the city decides that we're not going to listen to the experts. I believe that we have a lot of smart people that work for the city, and we should trust on them in many occasions to, on their expertise, instead of doing a study. But certainly there will be times when we need a study, but when a study is done, we should take more consideration in listening to that study. Ms. Beckman. I think it's important to do your due diligence and choose the right consulting firm. You better have trust in them. And when you pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars, I would hope you would listen to their recommendations. And that's not what the council did with Imagine Clearwater. And so the development is delayed. You have people not happy. And now we're, they're starting to second guess. Are we going to go forward with this Imagine price tag? And so I would say when you're, you, on the front end, you do your due diligence, you hire experts, you respect their opinion. Sometimes it seems that the council sits up here and wants to look for an answer that will confirm what they already want to do. Or if they get the consultant's recommendation and they get pressure from outside forces, then they change and go against the consultant's recommendation, the experts, and then we're not in a good position. Okay. With so much talk about downtown, many areas of the city, like Greenwood, the beaches, the countryside, feel left out. Are they? And if not, what would you do to change that perception? Mr. Elias. I think there is a huge disconnect between the city and our neighborhoods. And a good example of that is a conversation that I've had with the people in countryside as it relates to our fire station. We have three people who man that fire station. And they are obligated to go into Dunedin or Safety Harbor whenever there might be an issue, a fire, or uh, a wreck, wreck on 19, where all those facilities have to attend to that situation. Leaving the city of, of or leaving the neighborhood of Countryside uh, open and with no opportunity to, to, to return uh, services. If I'm having a heart attack and I know that the medical facility and, and this facility is out somewhere else, I don't have a problem. I'm probably not going to be surviving. And I think it's important that we listen to our first responders, and that's an issue that the that, that countryside has said we need to be listened to. And Mr. Thomas. Yes, absolutely. I have knocked on thousands of doors, and I can tell you that every neighborhood feels as though they're not being listened to. I was just at a neighborhood association meeting last night, and the same topic came up. It seems as though the city is only focused on one area, and that's downtown. And tonight's forum proves that. There's more to the city of Clearwater than just downtown. And if we want to listen to our citizens, we need to start going to them and going to their association meetings and things like that.
to listen to them and get their perspective and their ideas. Have more public forums. And maybe an idea is travel a city council meeting around the city. Maybe do a city council meeting in countryside to get more participation. I think participation is key, and it is absolutely the case that this current city council is not listening. Ms. Beckman. I agree we can do better to engage our neighborhoods. Um, I'm a member of the Clearwater Neighborhoods Coalition. I represent my neighborhood. Um, I think the CNC needs to have a stronger voice in our city government. Perhaps we could have a CNC um, representative sit on our planning board to be the voice of residents and neighborhoods in those kinds of decisions and have one vote. Um, I am out there in every single neighborhood. I've been out there all year, for over a year, knocking on doors. I see the diversity. I stand up there at that podium and I've spoken for residents um, and their concerns from Clearwater Point about building. I spoke there last week, um, residents on the beach about pedal pubs and whether or not they wanted to allow that trial on, on the beach. Um, I am mar a part of the uh, NAACP and the Clearwater, um, um, oh, what is our, um, Clearwater Leadership Coalition um, to advocate for the CRA in North Greenwood. And, and so I do know about that diversity and people are approaching me. Um, I have residents contacting me about environmental issues in Morningside. Um, so I'm here, I'm approachable, people are approaching me and I hope they will continue to do so. All right, Mr. Cundiff. Uh, I've spent the last four years in the neighborhoods. Uh, I go to each of the libraries 10 times a year and um, Whoever wants to come and talk to a council member, I'm there. I've been to almost all of the neighborhood, the active neighborhoods, and a number of the newer neighborhoods that have been coming online. Really happy for them. Uh, I, uh, on Neighborhoods Day, I travel to uh, six or eight different neighborhoods uh, every year, and I have spent many, many, many hours in your neighborhoods talking with you folks, listening to your problems, and helping to solve them. Uh, I'm no stranger to the neighborhoods, and you all who know me know that's the truth. A um, uh, couple more things. Uh, 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 Mr. Thomas said that our meeting tonight uh, shows that we're only talking about downtown. Well, we're not asking the questions. You're asking the questions. It's, it's not us. All I right? tried. <laughs> uh, and if I could just mention uh, the fire department, I, I'm all in favor of, of a new rescue unit for that unit if the fire chief wants it. One of the problems uh, is that they're not sure that the county's paying its fair share okay. of reimbursement to the city. All right, thank you. I'm sorry we had to cut you short on that. Um, yeah, uh, the police union is currently renegotiating their contract with the city and soon the firefighters union will be doing the same. What are their demands and can the city afford to return to compensation levels unions say they agreed to when times were tough. Let's start out with Mr. Thomas on that one. Public safety should be the number one priority of any government. The safety of our citizens needs to be at the forefront of every decision we make. Uh, several years ago during the recession, our police and fire unions took a, success, took a, um, took a cut, um, took a break, and and they deserve to have that money refunded to them and brought back into their plans. Um, that's something that needs to be done, and it should have been done already. Uh, Mr. Be Ms. Beckman. I agree. Um, as a public school teacher, I know that um, unions are often asked in, in tough times to take concessions, um, and I, I applaud our fire and police for taking those concessions. And now that we're nine years out from that, they need to be... Um, reinstated to their levels. Okay, Mr. Kunda. Uh, there's some things I can't say because uh, we council members talk with the chief negotiator for the, uh, uh, for the city uh, mm -hmm. with the unions. Uh, I can say that we're very interested in res restoring those cost of living uh, um, things that were taken away, the COLA, uh, uh, and we've already offered that to the, to the uh, police department. Uh, so we are beyond that step in the negotiation. We're not quite finished yet, uh, but uh, we are. Uh, we're, we're working toward that goal of restoring those. Uh, the fire department, we, we are still uh, waiting for, uh, for their offer and then our response, uh, but we're interested in doing the same thing. They have different demands, fire departments and the, uh, I mean, the completely different contracts. But we're doing our best to meet those goals uh, and... Um, 
keep the fire and rescue and police departments as happy as we can make them. Okay. Mr. Elias? I am humbled by the endorsement from both the Fraternal Order of Police and the Firefighters Union. And when I was in eighth grade uh, in Illinois, coldest day of the year, our house burned down and the firefighters came and there was one firefighter I'll never forget, didn't have a shirt on. And I was so impressed that I have a very warm spot in my heart for all the first responders. And as it has been said here, that these people, during the downtown of the economy, were willing to give up their, their income, if you will, because, for the good of the city. And now I think it's the city's turn to say, we're going to take care of our first responders. We're going to restore the value of your pension and your cost of living. I'm all for that. Okay. Let me ask a couple of yes and no questions. Would you be in favor of, and raise your hands, of adding a 24, a 12 hour or 24 hour rescue response unit to the countryside area? Let me see your hands. You just asked that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I know you answered it, great, but, but I had to ask everybody. Uh, okay. Um, how many of you are in favor of raising taxes? Okay, I, just I have wanted, pledged not to raise taxes. Okay, there we go. I just want to make sure we all had a, a pulse going here on that particular question. Uh, a lot has been said about climate change and sustainability in Clearwater. Uh, what concrete steps are you willing to commit to tonight to address these issues? that aren't just uh, platitudes. And we'll start out with Ms. Beckman. Sure. Um, I think that uh, Clearwater should set measurable renewable energy goals and carbon emission reduction goals. And these measurable goals should be reached no later than 2050 with interim goals. Um, by the end of 2020, the city should set environmental um, and resiliency goals and take action that will benefit our residents and our businesses. Our surrounding municipalities are doing this, and we are not. Our county is doing this, we are not. We need to be leaders to protect our environment, for our health, for our economy, and for our children's future. We need to put in place a revolving green fund that takes savings from renewable energy and efficiencies and reinvest a portion of that into continuing those projects. Our Pinellas County schools are doing it and saving $5 million every single year. This makes financial sense. It's not only good for the environment, but it's good for our budget. Mr. Cundiff. Uh, these are all good years, uh, good ideas. I don't know what the price tag would be for them. Um, we have a green print that the city passed a number of years ago. Uh, we also have a new sustainability coordinator, Sheridan Boyle, and um, uh, I believe that we should follow that blueprint, uh, green print, I'm sorry, uh, and Sheridan is looking at it now to see what needs to be updated. I'm willing to take her, uh, her recommendations for it and uh, push ahead to, to uh, meet, meet the goals that she thinks ought to be, ought to be set. Okay, Mr. Elias. I would say that the city is doing a, a pretty good job of sustainability and uh, equipping some of our automobiles with, with natural gas, uh, changing the lights to LED. Uh, they may not be in the forefront, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're making an effort, and that's better than not. Mr. Thomas, uh, you have two I, minutes. I think uh, the city is in the right direction now. We've, uh, we've hired a sustainability coordinator, but one thing that I do think we need to update is the green print initiative that was enacted over 10 years ago. That's something that needs to be updated. It should be looked at every couple of years to make sure that there's some updates. In reference to Ms. Beckman's um, uh, uh, statement about making sure that places are ready energy efficient by 2050, I think that's a great idea. However, I also don't think we should put the burden on homeowners and businesses to do that, we need to we need to encourage people to come, not give them reasons, more more hassle for when they come. Okay, and this is a personal question for me that I'll ask because I've been hit numerous times riding my bicycle, uh, unfortunately, and I'm very safe on the roadways except when I come to intersections and I get run over. Not a good idea. The Pinellas Trail is a wonderful trail that uh, thousands of people use every day. The problem is when you get to the city of Clearwater, what happens? 
They route you off near the railroad tracks that you can fall into the tracks and ruin your bike. You go through four or five intersections that are very busy, and oftentimes, even though there are flashing lights, people don't stop. And then you're put through an area that some people think is questionable before you're finally able to get up into Dundee and a little bit further, where people might feel a little safer. Is there anything the city of Clearwater can do to reroute that so that people feel safe, both from possible harm, but also because of the roadways are so difficult to maneuver in that area. Ms. Beckman. You know, I ride that route uh, frequently, um, right down to Dunedin or Honeymoon Island. Um, and it is a little bit of jockeying around to get through uh, the trail on your way to Dunedin. Um, we could improve it maybe with some signage. Um, perhaps we could paint, I know in Boston there's a Freedom Trail that's painted red. Perhaps we could do something like that. Um, we could have some signals. Um, we could do more landscaping. We could do some benches along the way if people wanted to take a break, murals, something to make it look, um, you know, prettier. I don't think it looks too bad, or I've, I've never felt afraid um, there. Uh, I just think it's part of the diverse trail that goes, you know, up north in, in Pinellas. God bless you. <laughs> you want to see my bike? <laughs> it's in my trunk in pieces, okay? okay. Mr. Cundo. Uh, I think it's largely the southern route that you're talking about. Uh, from, Primarily through from the above city. Clearwater, through the city south. Right, yeah, through the and, city south. And, uh, it is a circuitous, uh, circuitous route. I don't think it's uh, quite as safe. I do, I do agree that, that there should be very, very extremely clear markings uh, and flashing lights when anybody comes close to it. Uh, one of the problems, and, and I've talked with a number of bikers who, who use this trail once you're in the front row, but yeah. uh, 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 there needs to be clear marking, uh, and people who use the trail need to be careful. Uh, I mean, I would never think of not looking both ways before I cross any street, whether on a bicycle or not. Uh, and we have, we have bikers who assume that they have the right of way, and they do, uh, but uh, cars are a lot bigger. I think people see the flashing lights as an, as an appropriate target. Uh, I do think the downtown... Yeah, to gain 10 the points. Down, the downtown ought to become biker-friendly and develop things along that route. All right, great. Mr. Elias. The Pinellas Trail is a, is a destination uh, from people all over the country and actually around the world. It's a, it's a great facility, and I have been on that trail from all the way from St. Petersburg all the way up to Tarpon. And uh, coming through Clearwater uh, is not a pleasant experience. When I consider Dunedin, and I consider the trail that goes right through Dunedin, you see people all over the place. Uh, there, there's a bicycle, bicycle shop. I think we can do a lot to improve the trail as it goes through Clearwater, not only maybe moving the trail to another location, but also providing the amenities that will bring people to the trail, not only to downtown, but to the trail. I would be all in favor of asking bicyclists what they think about improving the trail. We ask everybody else who are not using the trail, people who do not use bicycles, for their, for their opinions. We need to talk to people who use that trail. Have you heard of the Hyperloop? Uh, yes. Okay. Just <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Mr. Thomas. Well, Al, I'm sorry about your misfortune that your bike's in pieces, but I'm glad you're here in one piece. <laughs> well, thank you. So, it was my family. <laughs> so I, I am not a biker. I don't ride my bike. However, I know people that do. Uh, I've never heard of anyone saying that it was unsafe, but I think it's something that we can look into and put some kind of lighting up there to make sure that it's safer than it is now, if that is the case. Right, and, and let me just make sure I was not disparaging any of the areas that it goes through, but merely because it goes through an area where there's so much traffic, so many flashing lights, and you almost don't know where you're supposed to get off. And again, the railroad tracks makes it more difficult. But anyway, that's my problem and not yours. So we have come to the end. I know we haven't covered every subject that we'd like, possibly. So here's what we're going to do. I've got two more questions left. This first one is called a freebie. And in the freebie, I'm going to give you a minute. You can talk about any policy you want. Um, and have at it. Criticize anybody you want, uh, whatever. So we're going to start out with Ms. Beckman. you got a minute to talk about anything you want to. This is not your closing statement. 
Okay, um, well, I think I'll discuss my three priorities for the city. First, I think we need to lead um, and develop uh, the development of a strategic plan that sets clear goals and accountability requirements related to top priorities such as affordable housing, environmental stewardship, and our city operations. And I can communicate this plan to residents and be transparent and accountable in all decisions. I've advocated for transparency and accountability before our city charter. I've advocated for environmental policy before our city charter and our city council. They don't, the, are bringing it to our city council, they don't listen. Second, I will engage with residents and business owners to develop ways to revitalize and engage their neighborhood and businesses and develop a unique identity and sense of pride here in our community. And third, I will address community concerns about the upfront and ongoing costs of Imagine Clearwater. Design modifications are needed to reduce costs, and input from residents and experts needs to be incorporated into decision making. All right, thank you. Your free shot, Mr. Cundiff. Uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure being your city council member the last four years, and I thought I'd just tell you some of the other things us council members do. We are on a number of county boards. Uh, I had a meeting today. Uh, as I do every other month with the Tampa Bay Estuary Board um, a CEO and uh, talking about a meeting that's coming up this Friday. Uh, we have uh, quarterly meetings with the Tampa Bay Estuary Board. Uh, I'm very interested in it because of the quality of the Tampa Bay water and the estuaries around uh, uh, Cooper's Bayou in North and Old Tampa Bay, and that's uh, where my neighborhood is. Uh, my neighborhood, by the way, I can't afford a, uh, an association there. Oh. <laughs> uh, poor neighborhood. Uh, I'm also on the Homeless Leadership Alliance, and uh, uh, anyone who takes this seat will have to probably do that because nobody else wants it. I'm enjoying it. We, re we are reducing homelessness. We're finding homes for homeless people. All right, thank you. Mr. Elias, your free shot. I think one of the significant issues that's facing our city is is the retirement of our city manager and the possible retirement of our city attorney. Uh, I think the clear city of Clearwater is at a turning point. It's important that we have a countrywide search for someone who will, will take the place of uh, our current city manager, Bill Horn, who's done a great job for us, and for Pam Aiken, who has been our city attorney. Very, very important. We need to take our time and we make, have to make sure that we find the person that's going to lead us for the next 10 to 15 years into our future. Your free shot, Mr. Thomas. Yes, I think the biggest focus of the next council needs to be fiscal responsibility. We need to make sure that every dollar that is spent is accounted for. We need to make sure that there's transparency and leadership through all counts of government. That's something that I want to bring to the council table. Um, I've served on my hometown, I've served on the school board, so I know what it's like to be fiscally responsible. I know what it's like to manage a budget. Um, aside from that, we need to make sure we're communicating with our neighborhoods. I mentioned that earlier. We need to make sure we're more welcoming to businesses. I'm proud to have the endorsement of the local Chamber of Commerce uh, because we need to cut the red tape. We cannot survive as a downtown or as a city if we're not welcoming to businesses. Um, and we also have to make sure that our citizens are safe. Uh, make sure that our police and fire have the resources necessary to do their job. I'm proud to be endorsed by the Clearwater FOP. All right, now we are at the closing statements. You will have a minute, and we'll start out with Scott Thomas on this end and work our way back that way. Scott, go ahead. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and taking part in, in uh, your local government. This election, we're at a crossroads. We can go in the one direction, we can uh, continue to elect the same people and the same type of people that we've been electing for the last 25 years. Or we can go in a new direction. We can go in a vibrant, we can go towards vibrant leaders with people that are not looking for the next four years and to get reelected, but are looking for the next few decades. I believe I'm that leadership. We have a city manager that is retiring, and I believe that these questions that were asked tonight, we should be asking to the city manager, the, the up, um, incoming city manager during those interviews. These are vital issues, and we need somebody who is going to be fiscally responsible, who is going to cut the red tape for business. I have the endorsement of the Clearwater Fraternal Order of Police, 
and the Chamber of Commerce, but the endorsement that I want the most is yours. So on March 17th, I ask for your vote. Thank you. Bud Elias. I'm a veteran. I have two degrees in political science, a bachelor's in political science, a master's in political science. I've been involved in leadership positions in Clearwater for the past 43 years. I've been chairman of the, of the Clearwater Chamber of Commerce, chairman of the YMCA of the Suncoast, chairman of Leadership Pinellas, vice chair of the Clearwater Aquarium, chairman of the Tampa Bay Think Tank, president of our Homeowners Association, chairman of our Country Club Board of Governors. I've been in the Charter Review Commission twice, vice chair once, and I was part of the Friend of the Phillies, appointed a number of years ago to be part of that process. So I can hit the ground running because I've been here, I know the players, I know the issues that are facing our city. I want to make sure that our neighborhoods are strong by providing the attention and services that they deserve, providing answers and solutions to traffic and parking issues, assuring that we have a sound, well-rounded economic development strategy in place, and implementing that strategy by hiring an outstanding city manager and city attorney. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bob Cundiff. I haven't mentioned much, much about fiscal responsibility, but I'm the only person here um, who is a council member and has passed four balanced budgets for the city of Clearwater. And those are half billion dollar budgets, not a small amount. And I'm proud of that and I'm happy for it and I've had that experience. Uh, we do have uh, a, a new um, city manager coming on board sometime this year uh, or next and also a new city attorney. I meet with them every, every week. I, I know uh, their hearts uh, and I think I'm best prepared uh, since I've been a council member the last four years to see what is necessary for coming up. This is not a time for on-the-job training. Uh, two of my three opponents have not lived here more than three years. Uh, and uh, I, I think I'm the best qualified with this wealth of knowledge I've been able to get these last four years as your servant. Thank you. All right, thank you. And last, Kathleen Beckman. So I have been a public servant all of my life. It is in my heart. I was raised by people who are engaged in public service. I am a hands-on volunteer. I retired from public school teaching um, f almost four years ago. I've been here. And I have been fully engaged since then. I'm a guardian ad litem. I work with the Sierra Club. Um, I started a little swim team at Ridgecrest YMCA. I work with Habitat for Humanity. I might not be on the board, but I'm out there laying sod and painting trim and working side by side with homeowners. I advocate for everyday residents, every day. I'm out there. And, and I've knocked on doors, and I hear what's important to them. And I've stood at that podium numerous times over the last three years and during the charter review committee spoken with and advocated for residents so if you want to look at future behavior look at what i've done look at past behavior i'm out there right now doing it because it's in my heart and so if you want someone to speak for you and who has represents your values and wants accountability and transparency and honesty and integrity and hard work that's me and so if you want change if you want progress please vote for me on march 17th wow these have been some interesting yeah go ahead and clap for the candidates absolutely And audience, you're going to help me. When is the election? March 17th. And what are people supposed to do? Vote. All right. By the way, thank you so much for spending time with us. We hope you can tell other people about these debates we've been having, and they can see it on the city's website or on the city's television program as well. Until next time, I'm Al Rochelle. Have a good evening.